was sharing with one of my childhood best friends recently the joys of being pregnant. And one of the joys is that you often get out of breath. And so she was sharing with me in her professional life. She started asking, does anyone have questions as a way to give herself breaks? So today if I ask if anyone has questions, (laughs) feel free to respond. (laughs) But I just might need to catch my breath. All that being said, uh, at my little UCC college in North Carolina, nestled among the magnolia trees and the rhododendron and the wisteria, I began the study that would lead me here to being a pastor today. I was a religion and philosophy major, and in a way that's unique to small colleges, or I think it's unique to small colleges, I was mentored and supported by Dr. Barry Sang. He would have me to his office to review every paper that I had ever written. He was there to listen to my bigger life questions and my wonderings. Um, And he was the one who who taught my first intro to Hebrew scripture and New Testament class. And at the beginning of every single semester, he would write the same thing on the board. One question that lingers every time I still come to scripture. What is the context of the text? This question takes us all back to middle and high school. Some of you who are teachers or have middle or high schoolers know this. It's when we thought about the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the for whom of primary source material. Who wrote it? What kind of writing is it? When and where in history and location was this text written? The why was this text written? And the for whom, what audience was this text written for? Hopefully, some of us use these principles to this day as we read our news or engage with our media, though who knows in this culture. But these questions are as important when looking at ancient texts as they are when looking at modern ones. We don't know everything about the Bible and about its books or about their authorship, but there are some things that we do know. Today, within the scripture that Laura is about to read, we find ourselves in the book of Hebrews, which is a Deutero-Pauline text. It's something that was written in the tradition of Paul, but not by Paul. Scholars as early as Origen in 158 to 254 identified Hebrews not to be the work of Paul, but to be the work of someone else. Though who that author is is still a mystery. While called a letter, Hebrews is really a sermon. This sermon was intended to teach and to inspire, hopefully as Seth's and my sermons do today. And the title of this short homily reflects its audience, Hebrews. It was a book written primarily for a Jewish audience, or an audience that still identified as Jewish but was starting to become part of the Jesus movement and developing early Christianity. Does anyone have any questions? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Giving clues within the text, we can speculate that this is the second generation of followers, trying to make sense of what from their Jewish roots they keep, what part of this past identity continues to follow with them as they gain this new developing Christian identity. And for such a little book in the Bible, words of blood sacrifice for me show up a little bit of an alarming amount. But see, this is where I, and and we all often misread Hebrews, taking this talk of sacrifice and trying to fit it into our modern lens. See, Hebrews was written for the ancient Jewish people for whom temple sacrifice was an enormous part of their religious practice. Hebrews is giving a different way, stating that God does not demand our sacrifices because Christ shows us another way, a less transactional way to live in relationship with God. Hebrews is a guidebook for early Jewish Christians then, and it's a guidebook for us now. For we too live in a world that is often transactional. And then, as in now, we need to be reminded that what God gives and what God calls us to 
is to break free from that transactional way of living. The ways that we benefit and participate in transactional culture. And God calls us to reimagine what does it truly mean to be one body of faith, entering into relationship, understanding, and celebration of the diverse ways that God has created all of us. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who were being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts Be glorified in your sight, for you, O God, are our rock, and you are our redeemer. Amen. So these words that Laura just read from Hebrews are about human community, but there are lessons from biological communities that echo this message. Listening to an interview with Professor Robin Wall Kimmer, who wrote Braiding Sweet Grass and Gathering Moss, Professor Kimmer speaks of the wisdom of nature that teaches us this lesson when she shares a story of how, as an 18 year old, proud to be going to college, entering forestry school, she shares with her professors and her fellow students that she is there because of one burning question. She wants to know why asters and goldenrods look so beautiful together. She's thought that this combination must speak to some sort of larger universal truth. These flowers are amazingly vibrant. You'll find them actually in the prairies all around us. They're they're bright yellow, chrome colored, and a vibrant purple. And these two plants, more often than not, can be found twining around one another as they reach for the sun. I can imagine, with a few snickers and stares of amazement, as she was told by her professors that her question was not a scientific one, but an artistic one. And that if that is truly her question, she'd better quit forestry school and enroll in art school. Demoralized, She was told flat out, your question will not be answered by science. That science demands that we set aside our emotions and our aesthetics. But, as it turns out, there's a very good biophysical explanation for why these two plants grow together. It's a matter of aesthetic and it's a matter of ecology. Those complementary colors, the purple and gold are together, they're opposites on the color wheel. And they're so vivid that they actually attract more pollinators than if the two grew separately apart from one another. So each of those plants benefit by combining their beauty with the beauty of the other. Because these plants embrace diversity, They thrive. So often we think the way things evolve, and we think about resources as limiting factors, materials that some have access to while others go without. We think of competitive exclusion, where the strong thrive and the weak die. But species, at least, are a lot more adaptive than we give them credit for. It's like that quote from one of my favorite childhood movies, Jurassic Park, life finds a way. Life's incredible desire is to continue to persevere and persist. And it can be seen 
in Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Island, who until recently were faced with blissfully little competition in their island existence. They enjoyed the biggest, juiciest seeds, and they thrived until the early 2000s when another competitor made their way onto the island, another type of finch. This finch, its beak was better adapted for eating this particular seed. And so the question, would Darwin's iconic finches be victim to the principles of evolution that they helped model? While these finches, like all of life, are subject to this theory, they're still very much alive and well. See, in a few generations, the finches' beaks became smaller, allowing them to specialize in a different form of seed eating, allowing for this new and old species to coexist together. For some of you, maybe, uh, who are lucky enough to either have a student or to yourself go with the Glenbard West students to the Galapagos last summer, this might be old news for you. You have seen this principle close up. But for all of us gathered here in church this morning, whether we've seen the principle in person or not, the lesson is one much larger than biology. It is a lesson of theology. Through the asters and the golden rods, through the Galapagos finches, God is teaching us a lesson. My brother-in-law, Tim, who studies evolutionary biology, was talking to me earlier this week about a scientific theory that I think has something to say about both biology and theology, both about the world and about God. It's called the diversity stability hypothesis. This theory states that, there, that the more diverse a community of organisms is, the more resistant it is to both natural and human-caused change. And then the more diverse the community is, the higher its productivity. Of course, in our capitalistic, transactional society, corporations have taken a hold of this. Within the business world, this principle is called organizational interdependence. And actually, you can find articles on Forbes, and Peter Senge of MIT Sloan writes on this concept a lot. But within our passage from Hebrews today, we hear this call. We hear this call to be in solidarity with those who have a different lived experience than us. We hear this call to embrace diversity, not because of its economic return, but because the diversity stability theory is true for the natural world and it's true for us. And because as people of faith, we hear this call to love. Our reading starts, let mutual love continue, recognizing that our liberation, our salvation, is tied up in the breaking down of systems that segregate, not to eliminate our differences, for it's our differences that truly allow us to thrive. We don't want to be all asters and we don't want to be all golden rods, but together we are exquisite. By existing together, we feed one another, we strengthen one another, in a way that on our own, we never could. Hebrews reminds us, in living this way though, we are called to act differently. If we're letting mutual love continue, we can no longer abide while there are an unjust criminal justice systems. We can no longer abide while some live with abundance, while others live in scarcity. We can no longer abide while folks are persecuted and tortured. We are called to live differently in our dependence on one another. A native activist, Lila Watson, puts it this way. She says, if you've come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is tied to my liberation, then let us work together. Our liberation, our salvation is connected. 
our ability to grow and thrive, to be God's people on this earth, is connected. So let us work together. Several years ago, when I was leading junior high youth fellowship at the end of the night, as I waited for everyone by the parking lot doors for pickup, a youth and their friend who was visiting ran off into the dark sanctuary. And so curious of what these junior hires were about, I followed. Because with junior hires, you never know. Right, guys? You never know what's going to happen. From the recycling at the back, this youth eagerly grabbed a bulletin from the previous Sunday that, they, that had been discarded there. And I stood back and I watched as they read our church's opening, open and affirming statement to their friend who was a visitor. And they excitedly said, this, this is what church is about. And friends, it is. It is what church is about, and it is so much more than just those words. It's how we make a place on Sunday mornings for everyone. The person in the pew who needs a place to sit in peace for an hour break from a frenzied life. This is a place where a person who's been raised in a theology of exclusion, wondering where their place in God's love is, Here, we make that explicit, that God's love, that this space and this table are set always for everyone, that there are no expectations or prerequisites of faith or action or unbelief. We embrace diversity because it's reflective of our God. Our faith calls us to engage our critical and curious minds and lets us teach our children every Sunday to do the same. We come to this place with a variety of beliefs and settle into the love of God and one another. We embrace diversity as we recognize the importance for making space and making space for groups like Oasis and the Glen Ellen Voices of Equity who make sure to create safe space for queer folk, that while the institutions of church have gotten it wrong, God's love has been ever present, and we hope to be a living testimony to that love. When we join with members of our own church to do the hard work of learning about white privilege and about the epidemic of gun violence in our country, When we go and we march with the young men and women of Precious Blood Ministries in the back of the yard's neighborhood, we are affirming that no one should ever have to fear walking down their street, and we're embracing the diverse lived experience of others. And we hear God in Hebrews today calling this holy work. And here in our church, we are doing so much of that work. And yet, we have so much left to do. In one of my beloved TV shows, Parks and Rec, we follow the local government official, Leslie Nope, played by Amy Poehler, attempting to make her community a better place. And there's so many gospel lessons that I've found within this this show, and there's so many laughs, but, but one thing that Leslie Nope says, she says it's, it's easier to be brave when you're not alone. To make the change needed to reaffirm how, that we embrace diversity, to celebrate our asters and our goldenrods, to dare to dream big about how we can not only talk of God's love, but live that love. In the words of our, on the front of our bulletin, and hopefully by the actions of our bodies. We need one another to do this work. It's easier to be brave when we're not alone. And in Hebrews, we are reminded that God is with us in this work. And who knows? Maybe in doing so, we will be entertaining angels unaware. Amen.